Chapter Twelve of The Dogs of Boytown by Walter A. Dyer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve Camp Breeches. Spring came, and with it more training for Romulus, until Sam pronounced him a fairly well broken bird dog. May drifted into June, and June into July another school year came to a close and another long vacation period began the great dog show was now a thing of ancient history and things were a bit slow in boytown it appeared essential to the happiness and welfare of numerous boys and dogs that something new should be undertaken it was jimmy rogers who suggested it though there were a dozen active eager minds ready to seize upon the idea and develop it they were sitting on the bank of the swimming hole near the brickyard, resting after an hour's swim and warming themselves in the sun. The dogs were either wandering restlessly about in search of new adventures, or were stretched out at their master's feet. The boys were somewhat languidly discussing the events of the glorious fourth just past, and bemoaning the fact that another one would be so long in coming. Fourth of July's all right remarked jimmy but i think the most fun in the whole world is camping out whoa scoffed harry barton when did you ever go camping out i camped out one night with my father in an old shack over oakdale way asserted jimmy that isn't camping out said harry camping out is living in a tent in the woods all summer catching your own fish and cooking your own grub and well everything did you ever do that demanded jimmy harry was forced to admit that he never did gee i wish we could all go camping out this summer said ernest whipple it would be great fun to take the dogs along well why can't we inquired jimmy many of the boys held inwardly a well-founded notion that there would be serious parental objections to a plan of this kind but their ready imagination caught fire at the idea and they were soon in the midst of a lively discussion of plans that gradually settled down from the wild and fantastic to the faintly feasible when they separated that afternoon it was with the hopeful belief that they were going to organize a camping expedition the expected parental opposition developed promptly and decidedly but when a dozen american boys get their hearts set on anything short of discovering the north pole something is sure to happen they did not quickly abandon their rosy project and they set about conquering the opposition by means of a determined siege the chief point of objection of course which indeed appeared insurmountable was the natural belief on the part of parents that it would not be safe or wise to let their boys leave home and go camping out without the guardianship of some older person no arguments could be invented to prevail against this but help came from an unexpected quarter theron hammond's older brother alfred a student at yale and a steady reliable sort of fellow was spending his summer at home and was finding boytown a bit dull after the activities of junior year at college one evening when theron had broached the subject for the fortieth time and his father had once more given a firm refusal alfred put in his oar ah father said he let him go and give us a little peace in the house it won't hurt him but alfred said his father you know very well it would never do to let those boys go off alone none of the parents would permit it suppose horace and i went with them suggested alfred horace ames was a classmate of alfred's who was also languishing in summer idleness in boytown that put another face on the matter entirely it must not be supposed that the victory was won at once however it required two weeks more of the siege to win capitulation all along the line but the boys conquered at last they liked and admired the college students and accepted their alliance with enthusiastic acclaim alfred talked it over with his chum and the more they discussed it the more they felt that the conducting of this boy and dog camp would be great fun horace had brought home with him from new haven the ugliest-looking and gentlest-tempered bulldog ever seen in the streets of boytown his name was eli and horace vowed he would give eli the pleasure of camping out with the other dogs of boytown eli was in training as a football mascot and horace asserted that a summer experience of this sort was just what he needed as their interest in the project grew alfred and horace decided to take an active part in the campaign and they called personally on every one of the doubting parents 
little by little they won them over until at last the success of the plan was assured mrs whipple was the last to give way but mr whipple had already been enlisted in the cause and he proved as ever a loyal advocate you must remember mother said he that jack is eleven years old now yes said she dubiously in her eyes jack was still a rosy-cheeked baby it is never too soon for boys to gain self-reliance said mr whipple this camp will do jack a lot of good and ernest too they'll have to hold their own on a common footing with the other boys which is what they must do in later life and alfred and horace are as reliable and trustworthy a pair of young fellows as i know they won't let anything happen to our boys so at last even mrs whipple granted a reluctant consent and fourteen boys besides the two older ones were at last enrolled as members of the expedition at first it had been understood that the camp was to include only members of the humane society and would be a sort of club outing but mrs hammond suggested that the invitation be extended to include also any boy in town who owned a dog on the ground that this might serve to recruit new members for the society alfred seconded this the more the merrier said he so the invitation was sent abroad and had already been accepted in two cases when the troublesome question of dick wheaton again arose the boys didn't want dick at the camp and dick evinced no interest in the project but the bars had been let down and there seemed to be no good excuse for not admitting dick mrs hammond advised them to invite him but before they had done so the matter was taken out of their hands the difficulty was solved for them one night jip tired of his ill-treatment heartbroken hopeless of ever being able to win his master's true affection and doubtless seeking a happier home ran away and was never again seen in boytown so dick since he no longer owned a dog was automatically eliminated much to the relief of those who did not want him it seemed a just retribution that he should lose the creature that loved him so but it is doubtful if dick cared very much i only hope said mrs hammond when she was told about it that this will teach dick a lesson and that poor jip will find a good master and pass the rest of his days in peace and happiness he is a dear loving little dog and he deserves it including eli there were fourteen dogs in the party which was more than had at first been counted on for not all the members of the humane society were dog owners though the outsiders all had to be it happened in this way frank stoddard had long been pleading with his parents to be allowed to have a dog and at last they surrendered and gave him one on his birthday mr stoddard believed in doing nothing by halves and so he purchased a really fine young collie sable and white named mctavish and usually called mac for short so frank had a canine companion for the camp and his cup of joy was full and there was still another new dog in town elliot garfield's uncle who knew of the boy's earnest desire to own a dog sent him early in august an old english sheepdog the uncle wrote that he was going to travel a bit and that if elliot would guarantee to give his dog a good home he might have him for his own you may believe that elliot was not slow in agreeing to that proposition it was a pedigreed dog named darley's lancelot of middlesex that was a name no one could be expected to use in calling a dog and even lancelot seemed a bit strange so elliot who possibly lacked originality rechristened him rover most of the residents of boytown had never seen an old english sheepdog before and rover attracted not a little attention on the street some people even laughed at his big round head with hair over his eyes and his shambling gait and lack of a tail but they soon got used to him and came to admire his wonderful gray and white coat and rover turned out to be one of the jolliest dog companions in boytown he loved the water and when he got his coat thoroughly wet he seemed to shrink to half his normal size he was really not much bigger than romulus but when his hair was dry and all fluffed out he looked as big as a newfoundland with rover and mac added to the party it began to look like a pretty big affair as indeed it was alfred and horace entered into the spirit of the thing with zest and arranged for the tents and general equipment they had both been camping in the adirondacks 
and they knew just what was needed so they drew up a list of the things each boy must provide for himself warm blankets a bag to be stuffed with sweet fern for a pillow mosquito netting and an aluminum plate bowl and cup for each boy a dish for his dog knives forks spoons etc besides the requisite clothing and toilet articles it was all done very systematically there was one thing that bothered alfred and horace and that was the cooking they ordered a store of supplies the boys having all contributed to a fund for that purpose but that did not solve the problem of three meals a day the boys had been inclined to pass over this detail somewhat lightly but alfred and horace knew from experience that feeding a dozen hungry boys was no joke and they didn't intend to have their vacation spoiled by the necessity of turning to themselves and doing all the work one day mr morton stopped alfred hammond on the street and asked him how the plans for the camp were progressing everything is going fine said alfred except for two things we shall have to postpone our start for a day or two because the tents haven't come yet then there's the question of the cooking i'm blessed if i know how that gang of youngsters is going to be fed mr morton stood and thought a moment well, maybe i can help you out he said at length i'm just starting off on a little vacation myself and i've been wondering what i'll do with moses moses was mr morton's colored man about the place i haven't enough to keep him busy during my absence and it wouldn't do for him to fall into habits of idleness how would you like to take moses along with you and guarantee to keep him out of mischief he was once an assistant chef or something in a summer hotel and i believe he's a first-rate cook his services would cost you nothing because i have to keep up his wages anyway i'd be mighty glad to know that he was being kept busy say that's a mighty white of you mr morton said alfred moses for ours he's just what we need so that matter was settled mr morton explained to moses just what was required of him and moses became a not unwilling member of the party the tents which had been ordered from new york came at last there were two of them good-sized ones each capable of accommodating seven of the younger boys and one of the older ones horace ames had a small tent of his own which would serve for moses on the appointed day the boys congregated at the whipple's table each bringing his personal equipment strapped in his blanket the campsite that had been chosen was at mallard lake about nine miles from boytown and two wagons with drivers had been engaged to convey the outfit presently one of these wagons appeared containing moses alfred horace the tents a stack of old lumber a box of cooking utensils and a second-hand kitchen range besides a number of boxes containing provisions when the boys had heaved their personal belongings aboard it made a big load then the human part of the expedition loaded itself into the second wagon with much laughter and skylarking and the party was ready to start the dogs were allowed to run alongside and a lively pack they were mrs whipple with a look of anxiety still on her face came to the gate to wave good-bye they arrived at mallard lake about noon and after unloading and sending back the wagons they sat down to partake of the picnic lunch that each had brought with him then came the task of pitching camp it was no small thing to accomplish before dark but there were many hands to engage in it and efficient leadership the camp was located in some pine woods that ran down close to the shore of the lake on the other side of a little cape was a sandy beach that looked like a good swimming place across the lake there were two or three farmhouses where the leaders had arranged for supplies of milk eggs butter bread and baked beans all the available floating craft on the lake had been hired and three rowboats and a canoe lay drawn up on the bank a little way back in the woods was a spring of clear pure cold water for drinking purposes and a pool where the milk and butter could be kept fresh the leaders told the boys however that they would have to wait another day before indulging in an exploration of the surroundings of the camp there was much to be done before night and all must get to work the two tents were pitched on a little rise of ground back from the water and each boy was set to work gathering balsam boughs for his bed these were strewn a foot thick on the ground inside the tents and the blankets were spread upon them each boy being assigned his place they also stuffed their pillows with balsam waiting till another day to gather the fragrant sweet ferns in a nearby pasture each boy also cut stakes and drove them into the ground about his bed to hold his mosquito netting 
ropes were strung overhead to hold clothing and there were two lanterns for each tent moses meantime had pitched his own tent and made his own bed and now they all turned to to help him knock together a rough shack to serve as cookhouse and pantry then a long dining-table and benches were built and a frame erected over them on which was spread an old awning the range was set up in the cookhouse the provisions were stored away firewood was cut and moses started preparations for supper soon a fragrant smoke was issuing from the stovepipe which before long was mingled with the smell of frying bacon and other things cooking that made every boy acutely aware of his appetite still alfred and horace kept them at work cleaning up around camp laying a stone foundation for a campfire and erecting a lean-to shelter for the dogs in stormy weather for it was voted not to allow the dogs to come into the tents moses made good his reputation as a cook and a prodigious amount of provender disappeared at supper that night the boys were in high spirits and so were the dogs the latter not yet accustomed to their new surroundings and not realizing that they were to stay there were restless and excitable and gave some trouble but they were at last persuaded to quiet down it was decided to tie them to the lean-to for a few nights until they should learn the rules and regulations after supper while the boys were gathering brushwood for a campfire jimmy rogers hoisted the camp ensign which created a roar of laughter i must explain about this ensign and the name of the camp some time before they had discussed the subject of naming the camp but could agree on nothing mrs hammond had suggested camp b h s the letters being the initials of the boytown humane society this did not fully please the popular fancy and yet they did not like to discard mrs hammond's suggestion they began trying to find a word or words in some way made up of b h s alfred hammond suggested camp beaches that sounded something like b h s he said and they would very likely find beech trees about the camp they adopted this name for want of a better one until jimmy in a moment of inspiration changed it to camp breeches this name really had no very deep meaning but somehow it tickled the boys and it stuck being still further revised in process of use to camp breeches the ensign which jimmy tied to a sapling in front of the camp was an old pair of boys trousers it would require a whole book to tell of all the episodes that went to make up the life of camp breeches during the next week of the fishing and swimming the exploring expeditions and burying parties of how the boys built a landing wharf for the boats and a diving raft and how they divided up the routine duties of the camp some of these episodes were glorious fun some were not so pleasant taken altogether they made up a memorable experience moses proved to be a master at making griddle cakes and other good things and once or twice a boy ate not wisely but too well and required the attention of the camp physician horace ames but for the most part they were healthy and happy and incidentally they learned many things about looking out for themselves one night a thunderstorm broke a veritable cloudburst and the boys had to put on their bathing trunks and go out and dig deeper trenches around the tents to keep the water from running in and soaking everything on another occasion a high wind blew one of the tents down on its sleeping inmates causing more fright than damage perhaps the best part of it all was the evening campfire by that time the boys were physically sufficiently weary to enjoy resting and the pangs of hunger being well satisfied through the ministrations of moses they would light their pile of brushwood and lie about it wrapped in blankets on the cool nights and watch the flames and fondle their dogs and gossip drowsily sometimes there was story-telling at which albert hammond was an artist and one afternoon sam bumpus came by special invitation walking all the way from his shack and that evening they had stirring tales of moose and deer hunting in maine then of course there were always the dogs sometimes it seemed as though there were too many of them and it was necessary to make each boy strictly accountable for the actions of his own mr o'brien was a constant source of trouble and unrest and there were times when it almost seemed as though they would have to send him home still everybody liked mr o'brien after all 
wicked as he was he was as smart as a whip and he had a way of worming into your affections in spite of you romulus and remus had to be watched because of a tendency to go roaming off together on hunting expeditions of their own rags was as ever a general favorite and heaps of fun and rover the old english sheepdog proved to be almost as playful and humorous he was wonderfully active for a dog who appeared to be so clumsy he could hold his own in a scrap too as mr o'brien learned to his sorrow in aquatic sports rover shone speaking of the dogs there came a night when one of them nearly upset the entire camp it was the handsome collie mctavish he strayed away from camp in the evening and managed to get into trouble with a little animal that is sometimes found in the woods whose method of defence is peculiar it was a black and white skunk mctavish returned very unhappy just as the boys were getting to sleep seeking help and consolation in his distress he entered the tent where his master lay in less time than it takes to tell every inmate of that tent was out in the open air moses and horace took the collie down to the lake washed him as thoroughly as they could with strong tar soap and then tied him out in the woods where the poor unfortunate's howls disturbed the camp's rest all night they could not send him home and it was two or three days before he was entirely fit for human companionship again End of chapter twelve Chapter thirteen of the Dogs of Boytown by Walter A. Dyer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirteen The Passing of Rags. Camp Bridges was pitched on a Wednesday, and the first week flew by on winged feet. On the second Saturday, an event occurred which the boys had been looking forward to with anticipation. Mr. Hartshorn came in his car to spend Sunday at the camp he brought none of his dogs with him which was a source of regret but he was a most welcome visitor none the less the boys feared that the appointments of their camp might not be quite elegant enough for a man like mr hartshorn but he fitted in as though he had been brought up to just that sort of thing and said it was all bully frank stoddard moved out and crowded into the other tent and a special bed was laid for the visitor moses outdid himself in planning his sunday menu mr hartshorn arrived too late to be shown about the lake that day but supper was a jolly meal and a new interest was added to the campfire hour that night mr hartshorn had shown considerable interest in mctavish and rover both of whom he pronounced to be fine dogs and this led to a general discussion of sheep dogs and their kin i wish you'd tell us something about bobtails mr hartshorn said elliot garfield i really don't know a thing about them and i ought to now i've got one please do echoed ernest whipple you promised you'd tell us about the shepherd breed some time well said mr hartshorn laughing it's pretty near bedtime anyway so if i put you to sleep it won't much matter for my own part though i'd rather listen to another of alfred's stories the night was chilly so he went to his car and got his auto robe wrapped himself up in it lighted a cigar and settled himself comfortably beside the campfire you may have noticed he began that some breeds of dogs seem to possess more individual character than others foxhounds for example seem to me a good deal alike that is because they live and work mostly in packs it is the constant association of a single dog with his master that develops the traits of personality in him no dogs have had this personality more highly developed than the shepherd breeds for they have been the shepherd's personal companions often their only companions for generations they are therefore most interesting dogs to know and to talk about of these shepherd breeds the best known is the collie it is in fact one of the most popular and numerous of all the breeds the modern collie of which mac here is a good example has been developed for beauty as a show dog and a companion rather than a working dog but he is a direct descendant of the old working collie of the scottish highlands which has been a distinct breed and has been used as a shepherd's dog for centuries the old working collie or shepherd dog which is still numerous in scotland is a splendid utility animal of great intelligence and initiative brave as a lion and trained to guard sheep though a straight development without much crossing with other breeds the modern collie is almost a different variety with a narrower head and muzzle better pointed ears and a fuller and finer coat 
from the fancier's point of view he is a great improvement on the working dog and he certainly is handsomer but in my own humble opinion the fanciers are well nigh ruining the splendid character of one of the best breeds of dogs ever given to man for one thing they have made the head so narrow and snipey imitating that of the russian wolfhound that they have left insufficient room in the skull for all the brains the old collie used to possess and with this fineness of breeding has come some uncertainty of disposition the modern collie isn't usually given a chance to learn the things his forefathers knew so how can we expect the same mental development mac i'm glad to say is not of the extreme type he would doubtless be beaten in the shows but he is a better dog for all that the older type used to be more common here but has gradually been driven out by the show type which began to be taken up about eighteen eighty the scotch are great people for dog stories and a good many of their tales are about collies bob son of battle was an old-fashioned collie many of the anecdotes that are told as true stories deal with the breed's wonderful sagacity in caring for sheep there was the etic shepherd's famous collie sirrah for example he could undoubtedly do amazing things with sheep one night something scared the lambs and they started off for the hills dividing into three groups the shepherd called his dog and his assistant and started out in the hope of rounding up at least one of the groups before morning but the night was dark and the hills a wilderness and the two men were at last forced to give up the attempt until daylight at dawn when they started out again what was their astonishment to see sirrah coming in with the lost lambs not one group only but the whole flock how he managed to get one group after the other no one could ever say but between midnight and dawn he rounded them all up alone and not one was missing this herding instinct is very strong in the collie i once met a modern collie in des moines iowa who because he had no sheep to attend to busied himself with the chickens and he would never consider his day's work finished until he had carefully herded all the rhode island reds into one corner of the poultry yard and all the plymouth rocks into another cases are on record of collies that were taught to steal for their masters by systematically driving off sheep from neighboring flocks many stories deal with the collie's intelligence in fetching help to a man or animal in danger one collie brought in a flock of half-frozen hens one by one that had strayed away from the barnyard and got caught in a blizzard he carried them tenderly in his mouth depositing them in a row before the open fire another collie brought home a strayed horse by the bridle shepherd collies are wonderful with the sheep but the so-called house collie is often more generally wise and adaptable hector a son of sirrah was such a dog and his master a mr hogg of ettrick has told many amusing stories about him he was always getting into mischief and mr hogg's mother vowed he would never go visiting with her for as she put it he was always fighting with the other dogs singing music or breeding some uproar or other but with all that he was so intelligent and seemed to understand so many things in advance that she used to say i think the beast is no canny his master's father was one of the church elders of the place and at one time accepted the post of precentor he knew only one tune well st paul's and this he used to give out twice each sunday to save the congregation from too great a dose of st paul's the son agreed to relieve him of his duties but here hector accustomed to his master's company on sundays objected he would follow him to church and when he heard his master's voice inside he would raise his in the churchyard much to the amusement of the shepherds and the country lassies sometimes said mr hogg there would be only the two of us joining in the hymn the result was that he was forced to resign and the church was obliged to carry on as best it could with the old precentor and st paul's hector exhibited strange motives and peculiar logic sometimes he was jealous of the house cat and hated her but he never touched her or threatened to do her any harm he merely kept a suspicious eye on her pointing her as a setter points a bird he used to join in family prayers and just before the final amen he would leap to his feet and dash madly about barking loudly it was easy to understand how he knew when the amen was approaching but why the excitement that followed i found out by accident wrote mr hogg as we were kneeling there he thought we were all pointing pussy and he wanted to be the first at the death next we come to rover's breed 
Old English Sheepdog is its official name, but I think it might better be called the Bobtailed Sheepdog to distinguish it from the original Smooth Sheepdog of England. In many respects, it is quite unlike any other breed that comes from England. He was formerly used by English drovers as a cattle dog, but we know little of his history. The Bobtail is the hairiest of the large dogs and one of the most striking of all breeds in appearance. Some of the puppies are born tailless, while others have their tails removed within a few days after birth. The Bobtail is an active, swift, intelligent dog, and, as you know if you've watched Rover, very playful and very expressive with his paws. Having no tail to wag, he wags his whole hind quarters to let you know he is pleased or friendly. The German Shepherd dog has had a remarkable boom since its introduction here in 1912. It is an old breed in Germany, and its appearance strongly suggests wolf blood in its ancestry. Originally a shepherd's dog, and still used as such, this breed has shown itself remarkably adaptable to police dog work and has been used in the war more than any other breed. The German Shepherd dog is not as gently affectionate as some breeds, but is intelligent, active, alert, brave, and loyal. I think I should also speak of the Belgian Sheep dog, partly because we are all interested in Belgium these days, and partly because we have begun to get a few of these dogs over here. They are said to be even cleverer police dogs than the Germans. A few have been successfully used over here by police departments of New York and vicinity, and a few fanciers have become interested in the Grenadale variety and have exhibited specimens in the Westminster show. What do police dogs do? inquired Herbie Pearson. I have never seen them at work on the other side, said Mr. Hartshorn, but I understand they are a recognized part of the police service in many cities of France, Austria, Belgium, Holland, and Germany. They are said to do wonderful things, such as rounding up gangs of thieves, trailing criminals, and saving drowning persons, including would-be suicides. In this country, their usefulness has been rather the prevention of crime. I have visited the dog squad in the Flatbush section of Brooklyn, there they are muzzled and are not expected to attack people. They are taken out at night with the patrolmen and scout around in backyards and anywhere that a burglar or hold-up man might be lurking. The criminals don't like that idea, and they have kept away from that section pretty consistently. I believe these dogs have also found persons freezing in the snow. Airedales have been tried out as well as Belgian and German shepherd dogs. For trailing criminals and finding lost persons, the bloodhound is most commonly used in this country, but I believe some rather remarkable feats of trailing have been accomplished by Belgian sheepdogs in Inglewood and Ridgewood, New Jersey. They are used mostly as ambulance dogs in the war, aren't they? asked Harry Barton. Yes, said Mr. Hartshorn, you have probably seen pictures of them bringing in a wounded man's helmet to guide the stretcher bearers to where he lies. They are also used as messengers and for sentry duty in the listening post, where they are much quicker than the men to detect the approach of a raiding party or an enemy patrol. I could tell you some interesting and thrilling stories that I've heard about these war dogs, but I for one am getting sleepy, and I'd like to try out that balsam bed and see if I like it. There was a little less skylarking that night out of respect to the honored visitor, and so everyone got a good rest and was up betimes in the morning. After breakfast, Mr. Hartshorn asked to be shown about the country near the camp, and everybody joined in the expedition, including the dogs. I suppose these dogs are all pretty well acquainted with one another now, said Mr. Hartshorn, but I must say it is wonderful how well they all get along together. It all shows the power of human companionship. Kennel dogs like mine couldn't stand this sort of thing for an hour. It must be that Rags and Rover keep them all good-natured. Sunday passed quietly and pleasantly, and then came another evening campfire. Some of the boys begged Mr. Hartshorn to tell them about more breeds of dogs, but he laughingly refused. Sometimes I'll tell you about the hound and greyhound families, but not now. You've had enough, said he. Besides, I came here to loaf, not to teach a class. Let's have one of Alfred's stories. I'm afraid I've told them all, said Alfred. I've tried to think of more, but I guess there aren't any. We've all told our stock of stories, said Horace. You're the only one with a fresh supply. I guess it's up to you, Mr. Hartshorn. The trouble is, said he, I'm no storyteller. But I'll read you something, if you'd like to hear it. 
I have quite a library of dog literature, both fact and fiction, and I've tried to collect every good thing that has been written about dogs. I selected two stories that are fairly short and brought them along, thinking there might develop a need for entertainment of that kind. Would you like to hear them? A shout of unanimous approval went up. Two of the boys ran to Mr. Hartshorn's car for the books, and another brought a lighted lantern and placed it on a box at his elbow. Then they grouped themselves about the fire again and listened with absorbed attention while he read them two of the best short dog stories in his collection, The Bar Sinister by Richard Harding Davis and Stikeen by John Muir. "'My, aren't those fine!' exclaimed Ernest Whipple. "'Haven't you any more?' begged Elliot Garfield. No, said Mr. Hartshorn, I'm sorry to say I haven't any more with me, but I shall be glad to lend my books to any of you boys who will promise to return them. They are very precious. I'd like nothing better than to introduce you to the dogs of literature. They're a great lot. Then he proceeded to tell them something of the best known of these books, Bob, Son of Battle, Ouida's A Dog of Flanders, Jack London's Stories, and a number of others. But I think, he concluded, that the one I like best of all is the true story of a little Sky Terrier named Greyfriars Bobby, one of the most faithful dogs that ever lived. Oh, please tell us about him, begged Frank Stoddard. No, said Mr. Hartshorn, I would only spoil the story. You must read the book for yourselves. It will give you something to do next winter when you can't go camping out, and I can promise you a rare treat. The next morning Mr. Hartshorn was obliged to leave, and everyone was up bright and early to see him off. He thanked them all for one of the jolliest weekends he had ever spent, and promised to invite them to a campfire of reminiscence at Willowdale some time. Then he got into his car and started the motor. I presume he had never taken part in so boisterous a departure. The rough woods road was difficult enough to drive in, at best, and the boys and dogs crowded about the car, shouting and barking their farewells. In spite of all Alfred and Horace could do, some of the more venturesome jumped upon the running boards and rode a little way, while the dogs, catching the spirit of excitement, dashed about in front and everywhere. Alfred and Horace rushed in to quiet the confusion, but before they could get the boys and dogs in hand, a sharp yelp of pain sounded, and poor old Rags lay a helpless, pathetic figure in the wheel rut behind the car. No one knew in the confusion just how it had happened. Mr. Hartshorn had been driving as slowly and carefully as he could under difficulties. A moment before, Rags had been barking riotously and leaping at the hand of his master, who stood perched precariously on the running board. Now he lay, mute and motionless, all the joy gone out of him, his eyes raised in dumb pleading to his master's face. A sudden hush fell over the noisy crowd. Even the dogs seemed to know that something dreadful had happened. Mr. Hartshorn stopped his car and leaped out. Jimmy Rogers was kneeling on the ground beside his beloved dog, his face very white, and Rags was feebly trying to lick his master's hand. Jimmy did not weep or cry out, but when Mr. Hartshorn came up, there was a pleading look in the eyes he lifted to the man's face, which was much like the look in the eyes of the dog. Jimmy did not ask any questions. He only moved over a little while Mr. Hartshorn leaned over and tenderly felt of poor Rags's broken body. I must have gone square over him with both wheels, said he. Poor little rags. I wouldn't have done it, old boy, if I'd seen you. You know that, don't you? The dog's forgiving tongue gave him his answer. Mr. Hartshorn did not scold the boys, but they all knew they had been to blame, and no amount of scolding could have made them feel any more remorseful. They stood about in silent shame and dread. The irrepressible Mr. O'Brien trotted up to see what it was all about sniffed at rags and then walked slowly away raising questioning eyes to his master's face when mr hartshorn arose he was winking very hard and biting his lip is he much hurt sir asked horace i'm afraid so said he we must get him away at once jump into the car jimmy and come along with me he made a soft bed of the auto robe on the floor of the car lifted rags tenderly in his arms and laid him on it watch him and keep him as comfortable as possible he directed jimmy that was all that was said and the car started off again leaving grief and woe at camp breeches 
Mr. Hartshorn lost no time in getting back to Boytown, though he was careful not to subject the suffering dog to the pain of rough riding. At Boytown, he jumped out and telegraphed to Bridgeport to command the attendance of the best veterinary surgeon in the state. Then they sped on to Willowdale. They took Rags out to the little building that was used as a dog hospital and made him as comfortable as they could. Mrs. Hartshorn herself brought him a dish of water, which he lapped gratefully. He bore his pain heroically, but he was suffering terribly, and Tom Poultice thought best to administer a merciful opiate. Then he made a thorough examination. "'There's ribs broke,' he said, "'and I guess he's er internal.' "'Then there's nothing we can do?' asked Mr. Hartshorn. Tom shook his head sorrowfully. After a while, the effects of the drug wore off, and Rags opened his eyes. Tom put his hand on the dog's heart and shook his head dubiously. "'I'm afraid he's going, sir,' said he. Mr. Hartshorn placed his arm around Jimmy's heaving shoulders and drew him toward the dog, who seemed to be begging for one last caress of his master's hand. Mrs. Hartshorn put her handkerchief to her eyes and hurried out. The surgeon arrived soon after noon, but it was too late. Rags had died in Jimmy's arms. End of chapter 13「fourteen of the dogs of boytown by walter a dyer this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen the coming of tatters after the unfortunate episode that resulted in the accident to rags it was as though a cloud rested over camp breeches there was no heart for merrymaking and when at last the sad news came of rags's death it seemed as though all the joy had gone out of life if you had never been a boy, you do not know how quickly a mood of hilarious jollity can be followed by one of deep depression. The plan had been to continue in camp for four or five days more, and some of the boys had been begging for a longer extension of the time. But now no one seriously objected when Alfred and Horace proposed breaking camp and going home. Every boy in camp had loved Rags next to his own dog, and even Moses went about in an atmosphere of melancholy. Sadly, they hauled down Jimmy's humorous ensign and pulled up the tent pegs. It seemed like a different crowd of boys from that which had so joyously arrived in the wagons but two short weeks before. On a sunny hillside half a mile south of the brickyard, there grew, at the edge of the woods, a beautiful little grove of dogwoods, which in May was always a fairyland of snowy blossoms that almost seemed to float in the air in this peaceful spot it was decided to bury the poor broken body of rags i doubt if there has ever been a funeral in boytown that was attended by more sincere mourners harry barton and monty hubbard spent an afternoon immediately after their return from camp making a simple little casket of white wood which they stained a cherry colour it did not seem fitting that so gay a little dog as rags should be laid to rest in a black one they lined it with soft flannel, and Jimmy himself, trying hard not to cry, placed the stiff little body inside, still wearing the old worn collar, and nailed down the flap. Theron Hammond and Ernest Whipple were appointed to act as bearers. The Camp Breeches boys were not the only ones who joined in that sorrowful little procession to the dogwood grove jimmy's mother was there quietly weeping for she had loved rags like another child and with her were two or three of her neighbors mr fellows closed up his store and silently joined them and there was a little knot of girls with mournful faces who had also known rags and loved him mr and mrs hartshorn came over from willowdale and leaving their car in the town followed the little casket on foot with the rest there was no clergyman present to read scripture or to pray, but I think the mourners were none the less devout. The whole ceremony, in fact, was carried through in almost utter silence. It had been thought best not to bring dogs who might not behave themselves, but Mike and Hamlet were there, for they could be depended upon, and it seemed fitting that Rags' canine friends, as well as his human friends, should be represented. A grave was dug in the sand, and the little casket was lowered into it. Beside it, Jimmy placed the battered tin dish that Rags had used and a much-chewed ladder rung that had been his favorite plaything. The girls threw in some flowers, and then the earth was shoveled in again, and the little company returned home. 
i hope the loyal soul of rags was where it could look down and see that his old friends cared and had come to do him honour at least his life had been a happy one and free from any guile and he was not soon forgotten not long afterward there appeared at the head of the little mound beneath the dogwoods a simple headstone the gift of mrs hartshorn and on it were inscribed these words here lies rags the best loved dog in boytown for some little time the cloud remained over boytown and there was little disposition to take any active part in canine affairs but youthful spirits cannot long remain depressed and as the autumn days approached one of the boys of boytown at least discovered a new interest in connection with dog ownership and that was ernest whipple for some time sam bumpus had been talking somewhat vaguely of the possibility of testing out the powers of romulus in the field trials and mr hartshorn himself had occasionally mentioned this ernest subscribed to a popular kennel paper and early in september he began reading about the all-american trials to be held at denby north dakota and other similar events the names of famous dogs were mentioned both pointers and setters and there was much speculation in the paper as to the prospects of winning the thing fascinated ernest but it was all a bit unintelligible to him he wanted to learn more about this sport that seemed to be followed by such a large and enthusiastic number of people and to find out the way of getting romulus into it so one day he and jack took their dogs and walked to willowdale for the express purpose of getting the desired information tom poultice was the first person they encountered and he confessed himself to be rather ignorant as to the conduct of american field trials i've seen many of em in england said he and a great game it is get a bunch of fine bird dogs out in the field in the fine weather with a big crowd following em, and maybe a bit of wagering going on behind the judge's back and the dogs all eager to be after the birds and every one of them in the pink and you've got a fine sport men the dogs seem to know too and they go in for all's in it but just how they run the trials over here i can't say you'd better ask mr Artsorn he used to own bird dogs months and i more it he's been all through it they found mr hartshorn in his den but he very gladly laid aside the work he was doing and asked good-naturedly what the trouble was now we've come to ask you to tell us about field trials said ernest well that's a rather big contract laughed mr hartshorn i suppose i could talk about field trials all night i've seen some thrilling contests in my time just what is it you would like to know well, we want to know what a field trial is how it is run and what the dogs do said ernest well said mr hartshorn a field trial is more than a mere race it's a real sport in which all the powers of a bird dog are brought into play it's a competition on actual game prairie chickens or quail usually the dogs are sent out to find the game and point with the judges and handlers and the gallery as the spectators are called following in the big trials there are three or more separate events one is called the derby stake for dogs under two years of age then there is the all age stake which is the biggest one and finally there is the championship stake for dogs specially qualified and the winning of that brings with it the highest honors in the bird dog world the order of running is decidedly by lot and the dogs are put down in pairs they start off after the birds and work for a stated length of time, after which the judges decide which of the two dogs won, the decision being based on speed, form, steadiness, bird work, and everything else that goes to make up the bird dog's special power. Then these winners are tried together until the best and the second best, called the runner-up, are chosen in each of the stakes it takes a good dog to win one of these stakes for he has to run more than once and his work must be consistent purses are offered by the clubs as prizes amounting to several hundred dollars at the big events occasionally there are other stakes such as novice stakes and events in which dogs are handled only by their owners in the big events the great dogs are usually handled by professionals who take the dogs right down the circuit and win all the prizes they can the trials begin in september in manitoba and north dakota on prairie chicken and are followed by big and small events in the middle western states pennsylvania and finally in the south the biggest of all is held in december or january at grand junction tennessee every year 
here the all america field trial club holds its classic event in which the winner of the championship stake is pronounced the amateur champion of the united states for one year winning also a large purse and a handsome silver trophy have you ever seen one of those trials asked jack oh, several times said mr hartshorn i have seen some of the most famous pointers and setters that ever lived run at grand junction and win their deathless laurels i suppose romulus wouldn't stand a chance there said ernest a bit wistfully well perhaps not at first said mr hartshorn though you never can tell it's a pretty expensive matter getting a dog ready and putting him through one of these trials even though the prizes are large but there are smaller ones and it is possible to try a dog out nearer home the first time with less risk and expense during the spring there are many trials held by local clubs throughout the east couldn't romulus be entered in one of those asked ernest well, i don't know why not said mr hartshorn i'll look it up and let you know meanwhile tell sam bumpus what you're up to and have him keep romulus in shape this winter i suppose remus couldn't run said jack i'm afraid not my boy said mr hartshorn kindly nose is one of the prime requisites and remus hasn't the nose as you know i don't care said the loyal jack i'd rather win at a bench show anyway when ernest told sam bumpus about the plan that worthy was much interested he made a special trip all the way to willowdale to consult mr hartshorn and between them they worked out a plan sam was enthusiastic now as to the superior abilities of romulus as a bird dog and he presently took him in hand for special training to improve his form and the other qualities that count in the trials off and on all winter sam took the dog out patiently and persistently drilling him sometimes ernest went along and he was amazed by the intelligence and speed which his good dog displayed when spring came again sam announced that there was nothing more that he could do to improve the form and capacity of romulus i'll back him against any bird dog in the state of connecticut said he proudly but before i tell how it fared with romulus at the trials i have one episode to relate the only happening of that winter which needs to be recorded for the rest the weeks passed without any momentous event with the boys in whom we are interested growing ever a little older and wiser and this particular thing was not of great importance perhaps it did not greatly affect the boy and dog life of boytown but it did affect jimmy rogers and jimmy since the death of rags had been the one lonely pathetic figure in the group and it would be a shame not to tell of the thing that happened to him one day in early december dick wheaton appeared on main street dragging a forlorn-looking little dog by a string he was a smooth-coated dog of the terrier type a rich chocolate brown in color with an active body and a good face and head but anybody could see he was only a mongrel no one knew where he had come from and dick did not take the trouble to tell where he had found him in his present state the dog showed none of the alert eager character of the well-born terrier he held his tail between his legs and he cringed abjectly this seemed to amuse dick wheaton he made little rushes at the dog and laughed to see the terror in his eyes he found entertainment in tapping the dog's toes with his foot and watching him pull back on the string wearying of this he began maltreating the helpless animal more cruelly mr fellow saw all this from the window of his store and his blood boiled within him unable to stand it any longer he started out of his shop to protest when he saw jimmy rogers come running along there could be no doubt as to jimmy's purpose his lips were tight set and his eyes were blazing he came close up to dick and seized his arm quit that cried jimmy between his clenched teeth dick was taller and heavier than jimmy and he was not unaccustomed to bullying boys of jimmy's size he shook off the hand and grinned insolently what's the matter with you mr humane society he asked i'll show you if you don't leave that dog alone said jimmy for answer dick gave the string a jerk it was tied tightly around the dog's neck and it hurt whose dog is this i'd like to know said dick in a taunting tone jimmy wasted no more breath in words he snatched the string out of dick's hand and faced him defiantly dick now angry in his turn made a lunge for the string mr fellows couldn't see who struck the first blow but in a moment the two boys were fighting desperately jimmy making up in fire and determination for what he lacked in size and strength 
Mr. Fellows felt that he was called upon to interfere. It would hardly do to let a fight like this go on right in front of his shop on the sidewalk of Main Street. Besides, other people were hurrying up, and it might end in serious trouble. Just then, Dick managed to break free long enough to give the poor dog a vicious and entirely uncalled-for kick, as though he were in this way scoring an advantage over his opponent. The little terrier rolled over and over on the sidewalk, yelping in pain and terror. Then he found his footing and dashed blindly into Mr. Fellow's legs. The storekeeper stooped and picked up the frightened little stray and took him into the store, where he did his best to soothe and comfort him. And it was wonderful how promptly the little chap responded and licked the kind man's hand. It may have been the first time he had ever tasted the milk of human kindness, but instinctively he understood and looked up confidently into this stranger's eyes with an expression of gratitude. Meanwhile, a little knot of men and boys had gathered out in front of the shop. It so happened that they were persons who would rather witness a fight than stop it, or it may have been that there were some of them who hoped that for once Dick Wheaton would get his desserts at any rate it was a real fight with no quarter and it would have been a cold-blooded person indeed who could not admire the pluck of jimmy rogers his nose was bleeding and his breath came in sobbing gasps but he kept at it with unabated fury three times dick wheaton threw him and three times he jumped to his feet and went for dick the fighting of boys is no more to be encouraged than the fighting of dogs, but there seem to be times in the affairs of boys, as well as of men, when nothing but fighting will serve. The only way to cure a bully is to thrash him, and if anyone ever had a justifiable motive for fighting, it was Jimmy Rogers. At length, Dick's blows appeared to be growing weaker. Jimmy, unable often to reach his face, had been pummeling him consistently on the vulnerable spot at the lower end of the breastbone, regardless of the punishment he himself received, and these tactics were beginning to tell on Dick's wind. His lips were parted, his eyes staring, and his face took on a strange, mottled look. He began to strike out weakly and to concern himself chiefly with parrying Jimmy's troublesome blows and protecting his stomach. With lowered guard, Dick staggered uncertainly backward, and Jimmy, rushing in, dealt him a smashing blow on the mouth that sent him reeling. Tripping over the doorstone of Mr. Fellow's store, he fell heavily and lay there, with his arm crooked over his face, awaiting he knew not what final coup de grace in an attitude of abject surrender. Men rushed in now, but Jimmy was satisfied. He shook off their hands and walked somewhat unsteadily into the store, and Mr. Fellows closed the door behind him. Someone picked Dick up. "'Well, I guess you've had enough,' said this unsympathetic person. Dick Wheaton slunk off home without replying. Mr. Fellows did not refer to the fight. He did not think it proper to praise Jimmy, for he did not believe in boys fighting, but he could not resist a feeling of proud satisfaction. "'Want to see the dog?' he asked. Yes, said Jimmy in a tremulous voice. He was almost crying with weariness, and he was doing his best to wipe the blood off his face and brush the dust off his clothes. Let me help you, said Mr. Fellows kindly. While he was bathing Jimmy's face, the boy felt a pair of little paws reaching up on his leg, and a cold little nose thrust into his hand. He stooped down and patted the little head. The tail came out from between the dog's legs and wagged joyfully impulsively jimmy caught him up and hugged him close it seemed a long time to jimmy rogers since he had felt the moist caress of a loving tongue and the thing went straight to his lonely heart during all the fighting he had steadfastly held back the tears of pain or anger but now weakened as he was by his exertions and the after effects of excitement he burst into tears burying his face in the little dog's warm soft coat oh little dog little dog you're going to be mine he cried mr fellows said not a word while caring for the dog during the fight he had been thinking what a fine thing it would be to keep him to fill the place so long left vacant by the death of his bounce but now as he watched jimmy he made the sacrifice this should be jimmy's dog the boy had fairly won him mr fellows understood how he felt he too had lost a dog so he merely stroked the dog's head and said, "'What shall you call him?' "'Tatters,' said Jimmy, 
and still carrying the dog tenderly in his arms he started out of the shop at the door he turned back with the flash in his eye again and i'd like to see anybody try to take him away from me he said i guess nobody will said mr fellows smiling and jimmy bore his burden proudly home it was wonderful what a change a few days of kindness and good feeding wrought in tatters he never became the favorite that rags had been but he was a good dog not without excellences and wisdom of his own and jimmy loved him and the change that came over jimmy was hardly less marked with another dog for his own he was himself again and every one rejoiced with him on Christmas Day, Mr. Fellows saw to it that the dog Santa Claus presented Tatters with a fine new collar. End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of The Dogs of Boytown by Walter A. Dyer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 Romulus at the Trials mr hartshorn found upon investigation that the nearest field trials were those at bedlow where the field trial club of eastern connecticut held its annual meet in april it was not usually a large affair nor prominent among the field trials of the country but mr hartshorn thought it would be just about the right place for romulus to make his first appearance as a contestant for field trial honors though not a large affair it was by no means insignificant and there were some good dogs in that part of the country and one or two kennels from which had sprung dogs that had won a national reputation romulus was pretty sure to have opponents worthy of him april fifteenth and sixteenth were the days set for the event mr hartshorn communicated with the secretary of the club and made the necessary arrangements ernest whipple filled out the entry blanks and they were properly filed unfortunately romulus was just a few months too old now to be entered in the derby but ernest was not displeased by the necessity of seeking bigger game and romulus was entered in the all age or subscription stake a purse of fifty dollars was offered for the winner and thirty dollars for the runner-up april fourteen dawned mild and bright and about noon sam bumpus appeared with romulus whom he pronounced to be at the top of his form after a bit of light finishing off the day before sam was to go along to handle the dog he had not had much experience at field trials but mr hartshorn had given him full instructions and if anybody could get winning action out of romulus it was sam mr and mrs whipple had agreed to let ernest and jack go in care of mr and mrs hartshorn and both boys were full of excitement of the prospect mr whipple came out to ask sam a few questions and i am inclined to think that even mrs whipple shared a little of the excitement sam as usual refused to come into the house saying that he preferred to eat his sandwiches in rome but he was glad to accept a cup of hot coffee and some cake which delia took out to him soon after dinner mr and mrs hartshorn appeared in their big car and the boys hurried out to join them they sat together on the front seat while sam ernest jack and romulus were bundled into the back seat with the suitcases and sam's gun it was a tight squeeze but it was a jolly party that set forth waving good-bye to mr and mrs whipple delia and the disconsolate remus it does seem too bad to have to leave poor remus doesn't it said mrs hartshorn that's all right said jack his day's coming you'll see as for romulus he was wildly excited by this unusual experience and treated the residents of boytown to a continuous barking in which tatters and mr o'brien and one or two of the other dogs joined running beside the car until it was well out of town then sam managed to quiet romulus they arrived at bedlow about dinner time and sam at once disappeared with romulus saying that he wanted to see that he had a good dinner and a place to sleep the others went up to their rooms and washed up sam did not reappear and the boys began to be a bit anxious don't worry said mr hartshorn he's a queer duck sam is but i fancy he would be uncomfortable if he stayed with us and we might as well let him have his own way i'll venture to say we won't see him again till morning but we can be sure of one thing romulus will be well looked after mr and mrs hartshorn and the boys had their supper in the dining-room of the hotel and all about them they heard dog talk after supper they all went to a movie on mr hartshorn's invitation 
for he said that if they didn't get their minds off the trials for a little while they would not sleep that night it was in fact some little time before ernest and jack could get to sleep in their strange surroundings but at length sleep came and the first thing they knew mr hartshorn was knocking on their door and bidding them get up they dressed quickly and hurried down to breakfast where they found even more people than there were the night before outside there were many automobiles and some horses and here and there a dog was to be seen blanketed and receiving unusual attention i don't know where sam slept last night said mr hartshorn it may have been in the stable for all i know i didn't ask him but he's all right and so is romulus sam saw to it that the dog got a good rest and he was up bright and early this morning taking romulus out for a short walk to limber him up after breakfast they all piled into the car and started for the fields a few miles outside of town where the trials were to be held the sky was overcast but mr hartshorn said he didn't think it would rain there was little wind and sam pronounced it ideal weather for the contest i hope it won't rain said he because a wet coat bothers a setter and gives the pointers the advantage there were a number of cars on the road before and behind them and now and then a man galloped past on horseback looks like a pretty good gallery said mr hartshorn when they arrived at the grounds mr hartshorn told the boys they had better remain in the car with his wife while he and sam consulted with the officials after a while he returned and announced that romulus had been paired with another setter named dolly gray i can't find out much about her said he at least she's not one of the famous ones so it oughtn't to be too hard for romulus the derby will be run off first so romulus won't be called on until afternoon sam has taken him off into the woods to keep him quiet in spite of the fact that romulus did not figure in the derby it proved to be an absorbing and exciting event to the whipple boys two by two the young dogs were called out and sent off in whirlwind races after the cleverly hiding birds sometimes no birds were discovered and then it became merely a contest of speed and form and ranging until the judges changed to fresh ground every now and then however one of the dogs would catch the tell-tale scent whirl about to some clump of grass or thicket and come to a rigid point his less successful opponent trailing him and backing him up behind them followed the judges handlers and gallery some in automobiles some in traps some on horseback and some afoot it turned out to be a fine day after all and the dogs eager and swift made a pretty sight among the old pastures and stubble fields for the most part they were kept away from the woods where it would be difficult to judge of their performances a halt was called at noon to eat lunch and rest the dogs already the constant shifting of ground had carried them far from bedlow and the men who were afoot were tired the dogs were wrapped in blankets and were kept as quiet as possible most of them being in wagons mrs hartshorn got out the luncheon kit and the boys found that they were famously hungry sam appeared during the luncheon hour to find out how things were going and mrs hartshorn persuaded him to eat something with the rest romulus he said seemed to be in good shape and on no account must anybody give him anything to eat about one thirty the judges called for the final contest in the derby a small lemon and white female setter named dorothea was pitted against a somewhat overgrown blue belton of the same species at first it seemed as though the advantage lay with the bigger stronger dog whose name was king arthur he kept well in the lead in the ranging but the wise ones noted little dorothea's superb form and said nothing little by little she crept up on king arthur and at length she swerved sharply to one side and pointed at a clump of alder bushes king arthur had missed the scent entirely the birds were flushed and the dogs shot over for that is the custom then the judges after a conference declared the derby closed and dorothea the winner the party from boytown saw a young woman rush out from among the automobiles and throw her arms around the little setter that must be your mistress said ernest i bet she's happy the boys were so much interested in all this that they did not realize that the all-age stake had already been commenced two pointers went galloping across the field and the contest was on from that moment the boys kept their eyes fastened to the successive pairs of racing dogs trying to appraise their skill and form and to compare them with romulus 
it was a better contest than the derby with more birds found and it was evident that romulus had opponents worthy of him one interesting contestant was a beautiful irish setter whose red coat glistened like gold in the sunshine he did well beating his opponent but he did not qualify for the finals at last romulus was called and with him the setter dolly gray she was a mild-looking animal but once loosed she led romulus a merry chase both dogs were a bit heady at first and did a deal of running without accomplishing anything but at length sam with his patient whistle got romulus straightened out and dolly gray also settled down to business she found the first birds but after that romulus beat her to two coveys in rapid succession and romulus to the great joy of his master and jack was declared the winner didn't he do splendidly said mrs hartshorn as sam came up with the panting dog well said sam he might have done worse and he might have done better he wasn't up to his top form but it was his first trial i expect he'll do better in the finals it was lucky he wasn't paired with one of the best dogs or he might have been out of it now as it is he's got a chance and i think it's a pretty good one i heard one of the judges say some nice things about him do you think they'll get to the finals this afternoon asked mr hartshorn i don't think so said sam but i've got to stick around they may want to see romulus work again they did try him out once more toward the end of the day and this time sam seemed to be better pleased romulus won his heat handily against a bigger dog and meanwhile however every one was commenting on the superb work of a pointer with a chocolate brown head and markings named don quixote and even the boys could see that he was a past master at the game he went at it as though he knew just how to make the winning move and he did it every time he ought to be in the championship class said mr hartshorn he's an old-timer and if romulus can beat him it will be a great triumph time was called as the shadows began to lengthen and the crowd tired hungry and happy returned to the hotel at bedloe at dinner everyone was speculating as to which two dogs would be chosen to compete in the finals and ernest was sure that the name of romulus was heard as often as that of any other dog except don quixote in response to the popular demand the judges held a conference that evening and chose the two who would compete for final honors on the morrow crowds gathered in the lobby to ascertain the outcome of this conference and when at last the judges came out every one was a tiptoe with expectation one of the judges walked over to a bulletin board and pinned up a piece of paper it read the dogs chosen by the judges to compete in the final heat of the all-age state to-morrow morning are don quixote pointer owned by the rathmore kennels and romulus english setter owned by mr ernest whipple the trials will start promptly at nine thirty a cheer went up all over the lobby and ernest and jack strangely enough found tears in their eyes that means said mr hartshorn that unless romulus is in some way disqualified he wins second place at least and to become runner-up in the all-age stake at his first trial is a big honor even if he isn't the winner i tell you this because i don't want you to be too much disappointed if don quixote beats him the pointer is a fast rangy dog an old-timer that knows all the tricks of the game while romulus for all sam's fine training is still green let's not expect too much that evening mr hartshorn did not even suggest a movie to take the minds of the boys off the great event of the morrow he knew it would do no good he told them stories of historic events in the field trial game and then sent them to bed they talked excitedly together for an hour after that but at last sleep claimed them for they were really tired and running dogs filled their dreams an even larger crowd followed the dogs to the trial grounds next morning for there were some who were interested only in the championship stake though they were glad to witness the finish of the all age the day was fine and sam pronounced romulus to be in first-class trim this time the setter seemed to understand what was required of him he strained at his leash and when at last he was set free at the command of the judges he was off like a shot neck and neck with the pointer and the gallery cheered old field trial hands told mr hartshorn afterward that they had never witnessed a prettier contest than that one the pointer was cool and collected but full of strength and spirit 
when there was any leading done at all he generally did it but there was a certain spontaneous fire and energy in the running of romulus that caught the fancy of the spectators and sam's careful drilling began to tell romulus settled down to the steadiest kind of work his form was perfect and beautiful to watch his scent was sure and keen the second move brought the dogs to a very birdy spot and the points became frequent in this department of the work it was nip and tuck between the two dogs no one could say that either had a quicker nose than the other or responded more promptly to the scent sometimes one dog would be first on the point and sometimes the other it was largely a matter of luck for the birds lay on both sides of a series of fields and the dogs ranged from side to side circling and quartering in a manner to delight the heart of a sportsman if romulus had a fault it was over zeal he covered more ground than was absolutely necessary he is doing wonderfully said mr hartshorn i am only afraid he'll run himself off his feet this is bound to be a protracted contest the dogs are so nearly equal in every way and endurance is the quality that is going to tell in the end as the race continued those who were familiar with the signs observed that romulus was weakening the more methodical pointer kept up his steady fast lope unflagging but romulus showed an increasing inclination to drop behind i'm afraid this can't last much longer said mr hartshorn the pace is too hot for romulus if he had had more experience he would know how to save his strength for the last ten minutes as it is it looks as though the pointer had the reserve power suddenly don quixote seemed to tap a new supply of strength and speed he dashed to the right then circled swiftly around to the hedgerow of wild shrubs on the left of the field and all so swiftly that poor romulus was left well behind as they watched they saw the setter stumble he recovered himself but stood trembling with weariness and nervous tension sam's shrill whistle sounded and romulus gathered himself together again but his feet seemed to drag he had lost speed Ernest Whipple was almost beside himself with excitement and fear of defeat. A hush fell over the gallery as they watched this last maneuver of the dogs, and Ernest's voice sounded loud and distinct as he shouted, Go on, Romulus, go on! The setter heard. He knew that voice, and he loved it well. Sam's whistle, which he had become accustomed to obey, had become monotonous in his ears. It no longer served to put energy into his flagging limbs but here was a new call a call that demanded the last atom of his devotion and will and strength he raised his head and looked about for an instant his lower jaw quivering then he seemed to draw together and bound away like a steel spring released straight ahead he went cutting across the track of the pointer and circling around clean in front of him don quixote surprised by the suddenness of this rush hesitated and looked a bit dazed the awful strain of the contest was telling on him too and the setter's burst of speed upset his equilibrium while the pointer still trotted along in a wavering course as though in doubt whether to lead or to follow romulus caught a scent from the bed of a little brook almost under the pointer's nose he whipped about like a flash and froze to a statuesque point that would have made a perfect picture for an artist the pointer still bewildered did not even back him up the umpire's whistle sounded and the handlers called their dogs in sam picked up the trembling romulus bodily and carried him to the hartshorn's car he's all in said sam he used the last ounce he had what a heart jack began fondling the setter's ears but ernest was eagerly watching the little group about the judges at last a man on horseback came riding up he was smiling my congratulations said he your dog won and i never hope to see a pluckier finish the forenoon was already half over and so the championship stake was begun immediately but the occupants of the hartshorn automobile had no eyes for it they could have told you nothing about what happened though they learned afterward that it was an exciting contest in which some of the best dogs in new england took part they were engrossed in their own triumph and if ever a dog stood in danger of being spoiled it was romulus sam wore one of the broadest grins the human face is capable of and ernest found his emotions quite beyond expression 
the party left early before the championship stake was finished and they made a triumphant entry into boytown the last part of the way they were accompanied by a noisy convoy of cheering boys and barking dogs and the town knew what had happened long before it read the stirring account in the papers in due course ernest received a handsome silver trophy engraved with the now famous name of romulus and mrs whipple appeared to be as proud of its appearance on the mantelpiece as any of the others there was also the fifty-dollar purse from which ernest was obliged to deduct a considerable amount for entrance fee and other expenses the rest he tried to force upon sam in payment for his invaluable services but sam would not hear of it why said ernest you earned ten times as much as that i didn't earn anything i didn't get said sam i raised that pup and i'm proud of him as you are i'm satisfied so ernest put the balance in the savings bank as a fund for financing similar undertakings in the future a great dog that romulus said mr whipple when it was all over i always did believe he cut a figure somehow it's a pity remus isn't in his class he didn't mean jack to overhear him he had no wish to hurt the boy's feelings but jack did overhear and came promptly into the room that's all right said he remus will have his day yet he'll show you End of chapter 15chapter 16 of the dogs of boytown by walter a dyer this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 16 the massatucket show during the winter the willowdale dogs had again won bench show honors in new york boston and elsewhere and mr hartshorn and tom poultice were now getting some of them in shape for the smaller outdoor shows of the summer season several of the boys made a pilgrimage to thornborough one day early in june and found tom engaged in combing the soft puppy hair out of the coat of one of the young airedales why do you do that asked elliot garfield it does seem foolish doesn't it said tom well you see a airedale's supposed to have a short stiff coat and if you put one in the ring with a lot of this soft air on him the judges won't look twice at him are you going to show this one asked ernest whipple yep said tom he goes to mineola next week it'll be his first show don't know what his chances are mineola usually has a lot of good dogs it's near new york and it's one of the biggest of the country shows we usually try out the youngsters and the second string dogs on these summer shows and keep the best ones for the big winter shows then we have a chance to see how they size up if a dog wins ribbons enough in the summer shows we figure he's qualified for the big ones next winter sometimes a dog can win his championship without ever seeing the inside of madison square garden he has to be shown a lot of times that's all and win pretty regular it isn't so hard to win at the summer shows is it asked theron hammond oh my no said tom sometimes when the classes are small it's a cinch take a rare kind of dog and he's apt to have no competition i wonder if any of our dogs would have a chance at one of the summer shows said jack with suppressed eagerness in his voice i don't know why not tom responded that started the boys thinking and talking and a week later they trooped out to see mr hartshorn about it half the boys in town had decided that they wanted to show their dogs and mr hartshorn was at first inclined to discourage them all it's quite a job taking dogs to a show and caring for em there and it costs something said he you have some good dogs in fact they're all fine fellows but not many of them are of the show type you would find the competition somewhat different from that in morton's barn i don't believe your parents would thank me for encouraging you to enter dogs that haven't a good chance at the ribbons and i'm sure i would hesitate to be responsible for looking after a gang of you but couldn't a few of the dogs be tried asked jack whipple mr hartshorn looked into the lad's eager bright eyes and smiled perhaps said he let me think it over as a matter of fact it was mr hartshorn's desire not to seem to show favoritism that made him speak that way for his own part he would like nothing better than to see remus and one or two of the other dogs have a try at the ribbons and his wife urged him to give them a chance the outcome of it was that most of the boys were dissuaded with quiet friendliness from attempting the useless venture while five dogs were eventually entered in the show of the massatucket kennel club to be held at weldon some fifty miles from boytown in july these five were romulus remus alert hamlet and rover 
these mr hartshorn thought would stand the best chance of winning something the old english sheepdog was entered under the original name of darley's lancelot of middlesex and for once elliot garfield was proud of the name mr hartshorn knew he had quite a handful of boys and dogs to look after but mrs hartshorn said she would help while tom poultice took sole charge of the half dozen willowdale dogs that were also entered the willowdale dogs were shipped ahead in crates as usual so was little alert the masters of the other four dogs however objected to a form of confinement which the dogs couldn't understand and it was arranged that the boys should take the dogs with them in the baggage car Theron hammond courteously offered to accompany mrs hartshorn in the coach and tom poultice took an earlier train so the baggage car party consisted of romulus remus hamlet rover mr hartshorn ernest and jack whipple herbie pearson and elliot garfield it was fortunate that only half a carload of baggage was travelling that day or they might not have been able to crowd in as it was they managed to find seats on various boxes and trunks and made themselves fairly comfortable the dogs with their masters for company were content after the first sense of strangeness had worn off i understand said mr hartshorn after the train had started that about five hundred dogs are entered so it ought to be a fairly representative show it won't be like new york of course but you ought to have a chance to see good dogs of most of the well-known breeds and the dogs at an outdoor show are usually happier and less nervous than if they were cooped up for two or three days in a crowded hall and compelled to spend their nights there there are really serious objections to the big indoor shows more danger of spreading distemper and other diseases too than at the outdoor shows do you think we will see any of the famous champions there asked herbie yes said mr hartshorn i believe some of the crack ciliums and wire-haired fox terriers are entered and there's sure to be a good showing of boston terriers alert will be in fast company the wires are always worth seeing said he after a pause it was a white bull terrier that won best of all breeds in new york last winter but during the last half dozen years wire-haired fox terriers have won two-thirds of the first honors the breeders seem to have nearly achieved perfection with this variety matford vick wire boy of pankton wire collar boy and several others have been almost perfect specimens but you never can tell their day may be passing and for the next few years it may be airedales or bulldogs or almost any other breed that will force its way to the top that's one of the interesting features of the dog show game then sometimes you find all predictions upset and all the big dogs beaten by a greyhound or an old english sheepdog there's always a chance for everybody as the train pulled up at a station somewhere along the line a man entered the baggage car with a brace of beagles on a leash nice little dogs they were with friendly eyes and beautiful faces is the baggage man here asked the man i haven't seen him lately said mr hartshorn is there anything we can do for you why yes said the man i'm sending these dogs down to weldon there'll be someone to call for them there you look as though you might be bound for that place yourselves and if you could keep an eye on these dogs it would be a great favor we'll do so with pleasure said mr hartshorn what are their names asked ernest tippecanoe and tyler too he answered i'm entering them as singles and as a brace and i think i stand a pretty good show the baggage man came along and by the time the owner of the beagles had arranged for their shipment the train was ready to start again it's lucky you were here to take them said the man or i shouldn't have been able to send them this way good-bye and good luck good-bye they shouted and proceeded to get acquainted with the beagles they're like small hounds aren't they said jack yes said mr hartshorn they are really hounds oh said ernest that makes me think you never told us about the hound breeds and you said you would some time couldn't you do it now well let's see said mr hartshorn opening his grip ah yes here it is he took out a small paper-covered book containing the standards of the different breeds i always mean to take this with me to the shows without my books i can't always remember the facts but with the help of this i guess i can make out now there still remain the hound and greyhound families to be covered they are both hounds in a way but they have been distinct for centuries they are both very old types of dogs we will begin with the bloodhound because he's the biggest 
there are a lot of people who have got their ideas about the bloodhound from uncle tom's cabin and there are places where you aren't allowed to keep a bloodhound because the breed is supposed to be so dangerous and ferocious but that is a great injustice the true english bloodhound is not the mongrel beast that was used in slavery days but is a finely developed and reliable dog contrary to the general belief the modern bloodhound is not ferocious but gentle and affectionate almost shy he is a wonderful trailer and has often been successfully used to find both criminals and lost persons but he does not attack them when he finds them the otter hound is an english dog not common with us he has a unique appearance something like a bloodhound in a rough coat with a face not unlike that of an airedale terrier or a wire-haired pointing griffin he is a steady and methodical hunter sure on the trail a strong swimmer brave patient and affectionate the foxhound is the most popular sporting dog of england his history being bound up with that of british hunting i guess you know what a foxhound looks like the american kennel club recognizes two separate classes of foxhounds the english and the american the latter is of course native bred and is somewhat smaller and lighter in bone than the english hound the so-called american coon hound is a dog of the foxhound type and of foxhound origin bred carelessly as to type but trained to hunt the raccoon and opossum the name harrier was first given somewhat indiscriminately to all english hunting hounds before the foxhound was highly developed later the harrier was developed as a separate breed for hunting hares it is now rare in england and there are almost no harriers in the united states the beagle is like a smaller finer foxhound and has the same ancestry he is a good all-round sporting dog and a good-looking fellow as you see with a solid build a rugged appearance and a fine face the dachshund don't call it dashhund is a canine dwarf best known for his absurdly disproportionate appearance but he is a most attractive serviceable little dog he was evolved long ago from the hounds of germany for the special work of hunting the badger his bent forelegs and queer proportions are really deformities scientifically bred the dachshund has a wonderful nose and is a good worker with foxes as well as with ground animals though his peculiar build best suits him for the latter he is a clean companionable house dog affectionate and spirited the basset is a short-legged french hound resembling the german dachshund to which it is doubtless related we are not familiar with the breed in this country. It looks like a large dachshund with a bloodhound head. Do you know any good hound stories? said Jack, who was fondling the long velvety ears of the two beagles. Oh, not many, said Mr. Hartshorn. Most of the foxhound stories I have heard have illustrated the sagacity and cleverness of the fox rather than that of the hound. There are also one or two stories that show that the hound has a strong homing instinct like that of some of the other breeds. The only foxhound anecdote of an amusing nature that I recall is told of one that was owned by a strict Roman Catholic whenever lent arrived this dog always ran away and paid a round of visits on protestant acquaintances until easter ushered in a period of more varied menus at home this hound was not trained with a pack but was kept as a single pet which accounts for his marked personality more like that of a terrier than of a hound i have read a number of accounts in the newspapers describing rescues by bloodhounds I remember one was about a Brooklyn girl who wandered away from a hotel and was lost on a mountain in Vermont. A famous bloodhound was brought over from Fairhaven and was allowed to smell of a handkerchief belonging to the girl. He took up her trail at the village store and followed it along roads where horses and automobiles had been, through two other villages and into the woods, and he at last found the girl on the verge of exhaustion far up the mountainside another bloodhound in california found a lost child at the edge of a cliff in a dense fog and drew him back from the precipice just in time most of the bloodhound stories are of that nature though there are some that have to do with the trailing of criminals one of the classic stories of literature is that of the hound of montergas 
he may have been a st hubert's hound or one of the other french hounds though i have always suspected that he may have been a matin or dog of the great dane type but the breed is a matter of minor importance the main features of the story are somewhat as follows there were once two officers of the king's bodyguard in france named macaire and montdidier fast friends at first they became bitter enemies and rivals and one day in the forest of bondy near paris after a violent quarrel macaire drew his sword and slew montdidier and buried his body in the woods now montdidier owned a faithful hound who came to search for him he traced him to the grave and there he remained until he was nearly famished the poets would have us believe that the dog reached the conclusion that his master had been slain that he discovered the scent of the murderer and that he set out in quest of vengeance at any rate he went to the home of a friend of his dead master's and was given food he attached himself to this household but went often to the grave of course montdidier's comrade soon missed him and his absence was reported to charles v the king foul play was suspected and the king ordered an investigation but no evidence was forthcoming meanwhile montdidier's friend had also become suspicious and one day he followed the hound to the grave observing the dog's actions he surmised what must be there he reported the matter to the king who had the body exhumed and discovered marks of violence on several occasions after that the hound attempted to attack macaire but was prevented from doing him injury he was entirely peaceable toward everybody else so that these circumstances were noticed guardsmen remembered that macaire and montdidier had quarrelled and suspicion fastened itself upon macaire the king was told of all this and he himself observed the actions of the hound when he was brought near his master's murderer in those days it was sometimes the custom for judges to settle a dispute by ordering the contestants to fight a duel king charles decided to adopt this method in an effort to determine whether or not macaire was guilty and he ordered a trial combat to take place between the man and the dog at the chateau of montagis on the isle of notre dame paris the man was given a stout cudgel as his only weapon while the dog was provided with an empty cask into which he might retreat if too hard pressed the battle was a terrible one macaire fighting for his life and the dog to revenge his dead master the hound paid no heed to the blows that were rained upon him but attacked blindly at last he had a firm grip on the man's throat and hung on macaire weakening and terrified begged to be rescued and confessed his guilt the dog was dragged away at last and the gallows robbed him of his revenge whew exclaimed herbie pearson some story got any more like that mr hartshorn half a dozen of them replied mr hartshorn with a laugh but they'll have to wait till another time as i believe we are nearing our destination for the same reason i must postpone telling you about the dogs of the greyhound family here we are boys tom polstice was waiting for them at the weldon station and so was the man who had come for the two beagles under tom's guidance they walked out to the fairgrounds which were only a mile away this was to be the scene of the show and there were already a number of dogs and crates about i've arranged to stay out here said tom there's an house where i can sleep and i can look after all the dogs they looked around the grounds a bit mr hartshorn found the superintendent of the show and had a few words with him and then they all returned to town leaving the dogs in tom's care they were all well acquainted with him and did not feel that they were being left among total strangers they registered at the hotel which they found to be overcrowded an extra cot was placed in one of the rooms and ernest jack and elliot were assigned to it they did not consider the situation to be any hardship they enjoyed a good dinner in the dining-room and then gathered in mr hartshorn's room for a talk after discussing dog shows some more and speculating as to the outcome of the morrow's contest ernest whose thirst for dog learning was insatiable reminded mr hartshorn of his promise to tell them about the breeds of the greyhound family the greyhound proper said he is of course the first to be considered it is perhaps the oldest distinct type of dog now in existence 
likenesses of greyhounds are to be seen in relics of assyrian egyptian greek and roman sculpture and the type has altered surprisingly little in seven thousand years it was developed for great speed from the first and was used in the chase unlike the other hounds the dogs of the greyhound family hunt by sight and not by scent the whippet is merely a smaller greyhound but has been bred as a separate variety for upward of a century on a short course the whippet is faster than a racehorse covering the usual two hundred yards in about twelve seconds whippet racing as a sport has never taken hold in america and we have comparatively few of the breed here you have already been told about the italian greyhound it belongs to the greyhound family but is classed as a toy although speed is the thing for which the greyhound is most famous stories have been told which illustrate the breed's fidelity and sagacity when his master makes a comrade of him i will tell you one of these tales a french officer named saint leger was imprisoned in vincennes near paris during the war of saint bartholomew he had a female greyhound that was his dearest friend and he asked to have her brought to him in prison this request was denied and the dog was sent back to saint leger's home in the rue des lions saint paul she would not remain there however and at the first opportunity she returned to the prison and barked outside the walls when she came under her master's window he tossed a piece of bread out to her and in this way she discovered where he was she contrived to visit him every day and incidentally she won the admiration and affection of one of the jailers who smuggled her in occasionally to see her master saint leger was at last released but his health was broken and in six months he died the dog grieved for him and would not be comforted by any of the members of the household at last she ran away and attached herself to the jailer who had befriended her and her master and with him she lived happily till the day of her death now we come to one of the grandest breeds of all the irish wolfhound it is a breed of great antiquity and of great size and power the latin writer pliny speaks of it as canis graeus abernicus and in ireland it was known as sagrim or wolf dog for in ancient ireland there were huge wolves and also enormous elk and the great dogs were used to hunt them these hounds were even used in battle in the old days of the irish kings two classic stories are told of the irish wolfhound one is of the hound of ogram there was an irish knight or officer who had his wolfhound with him at the battle of ogram and together they slew many of the enemy but at last the master himself was killed he was stripped and left on the battlefield to be devoured by wolves but his faithful dog never left him he remained at his side day and night feeding on other dead bodies on the battlefield but allowing neither man nor beast to come near that of his master until nothing was left of it but a pile of whitening bones then he was forced to go farther away in search of food but from july till january he never failed to return to the bones of his master every night one evening some soldiers crossed the battlefield and one of them came over to see what manner of beast the wolfhound was the dog thinking his master's bones were about to be disturbed attacked the soldier who called loudly for help another soldier came running up and shot the faithful dog the other story is that of a devoted galert which you may have heard robert spencer made a poem or ballad of it i've never heard it said jack whipple nor i said elliot garfield well said mr hartshorn it's a rather tragic story put into plain and unadorned prose it runs something like this galert was an irish wolfhound of great strength and great intelligence that had been presented by king john in twelve o five to llewellyn the great who lived near the base of snowdon mountain galert became devoted to his master and at night sentinel to his master's bed as the poem has it by day he hunted with him one day however galert did not appear at the chase and when llewellyn came home he was angry with the dog for failing him he was in that frame of mind when he met galert coming out of the chamber of his child the dog was covered with blood llewellyn rushed into the room and discovered the bed overturned the coverlet stained with gore and the child missing 
he called to the boy but got no response believing that there was but one interpretation for all this llewellyn called gelert to him and in his wrath thrust his sword through the dog's body gelert gave a great cry of anguish that sounded almost human and then with his eyes fixed reproachfully on his slayer's face he died then another cry was heard that of the child who had been awakened from sleep by the shriek of the dying dog llewellyn rushed forward and found the child safe and unscratched in a closet where he had fallen asleep the father hurried back to the bloody bed and beneath it he found the dead body of a huge gray wolf which told the whole story in remorse llewellyn erected a tomb and chapel to the memory of faithful gelert and the place is called beth gelert to this day there was a suspicious moisture about more than one pair of eyes as mr hartshorn finished this narrative and he hurried on to less tragic matters the irish wolfhound is to-day a splendid animal said he and the breed deserves to be better known in this country it has had an interesting history there was a time when it nearly died out in ireland and the modern breed was started with the remnants some fifty years ago with the help of great dane and scottish deerhound crosses the new breed was not thoroughly established however until the latter part of the last century as a made breed so called it is a remarkable example of what can be accomplished by patient scientific breeding the irish wolfhound is a big active sagacious wonderfully companionable dog muscular and graceful and as full of fun as a terrier the scottish deerhound is similar in most respects to the irish wolfhound but is lighter speedier and less powerful they have a common ancestry though the two breeds were distinct as long ago as the twelfth century the breed was a favorite with sir walter scott the russian wolfhound known in russia as the borzoi is one of the most graceful and aristocratic of all the breeds combining speed strength symmetry and a beautiful coat he has been used for centuries in russia for hunting wolves and has been bred as the sporting dog of the aristocracy it makes a dog show a lot more interesting to know something about the different breeds said ernest whipple of course it does said mr hartshorn and if i'm not mistaken i have told you something about almost every breed that you will ever be likely to see at a dog show or anywhere else soon afterward they separated for the night End of chapter 16